In the last lecture, we explored the link between the empirical formula of a compound and the coordination numbers of the species that are present. But the question becomes, what do we do once we know the coordination numbers? And in this lecture, we're going to look at the topology of crystal structures. We're going to look at networks. This concept is good not only for simple crystal structures like binary compounds, but it's also very powerful for framework compounds like zeolites and MOFs. And in the following lecture, we'll get into that a little bit more. But for now, let's just apply the ideas of networks to think about some of the common crystal structures we encounter. Let's start with a little vocabulary that we need to talk about networks. A vertex is a linking point. In our discussion, the vertex is generally going to be an atom. But when we get to more complicated crystal structures like MOFs and zeolites, we might oftentimes encounter a cluster of atoms for the vertex. Now, the vertices are linked in some way. And the edge that goes between two vertices, the line, if you will, is the linker. Now, in many of the things we're going to talk about today, simple elements and binary compounds, that linker is just a bond. But we'll see how we can also think of the linker as being an atom, like the oxygen atoms would be in a zeolite. And then we can also have even longer linkers, such as molecules or polyatomic anions. So we might think of the cyanide in Prussian blue as the linker. Or in a MOF, we might have some kind of dicarboxylic acid. So we're going to describe crystal structures as being made up of these vertices and the linkers. Now, the topology tells us that we have certain kinds of networks of vertices and linkers. In theory, there's an infinite number of networks, but we will encounter a finite number that are important in crystal chemistry. Those networks where all of the vertices are the same are called uninodal networks. And then if we have two different kinds of vertices, then we can call that a binodal network. So in the last lecture, we talked about the bond graph for TiO2. And we saw that the titanium was six coordinate and the oxygen was three coordinate. So we could describe the structures of TiO2 as being made up of six coordinate vertices and three coordinate vertices. And that would be a 6-3 binodal net. Now, there are a very few networks that are sufficiently symmetric that all the vertices are equivalent, all of the edges are equivalent, and all of the angles are going to be equivalent. And those networks are called regular networks. So I give a reference at the bottom by Mike O'Keefe and Omar Yagi and some of their co-workers that a lot of this material was taken from. That reference is now, I see, 21 years old. And if you look in the literature, you will find many follow-up articles by O'Keefe and Yagi. But here in this lecture, we're just going to get on to some of the basics. But of course, this is a very rich field. And if you were to work in an area such as MOFs, such as zeolites, it would certainly be in your interest to understand this at a much deeper level than we could get into in this lecture. Let's start by looking at some uninodal networks. Here I show two examples of uninodal three connected networks. By that I mean that each vertex is linked to three other vertices. And so one very familiar, very symmetric three connected network is the graphite net that we see on the left. Of course, this is just for a two dimensional structure. If we look on the right, we see the silicon network in the zintel phase SRSI2. And if we think about uh, what we talked about a couple lectures ago, uh, thinking about this as a zintel phase, the strontium is going to donate two electrons to the silicon network. And that means the electron count per silicon is five. And so we expect each silicon to make three bonds to other silicons and have one non-bonding electron pair. What we can get is this idealized network here, which is a regular network of triangles. All right? So this is the most symmetric uh, 
network you can get of connected triangles in three dimensions. Here are a couple of four connected nets. On the right, we see the familiar network of diamond. And we know that diamond is made up of tetrahedra. And in fact, the site symmetry of the carbon atom in diamond is a perfect tetrahedron. But there's another network called the Lonsdalite network, also tetrahedral vertices, but the symmetry is different. The space group for Lonsdalite is the P63 over MMC. So this is a hexagonal crystal structure. And the site symmetry we can see here is 3M or C3V. All right, so this is not a regular network because we don't have a perfect tetrahedron at each vertex. Okay, we only have C3V symmetry. But it is a perfectly valid four-connected tetrahedral net. And so this is a good lesson that we can have the same basic shape at the vertex, at tetrahedron in both cases, but yet there can be different networks. It is not very obvious from this view, but if you were to draw a view where you showed all of the polyhedra connected, you would see that in diamond we have an ABC, ABC, ABC repeating pattern of tetrahedra, whereas in Lonsdalite we have an AB, AB, AB repeating pattern of tetrahedra. We're going to skip over five connected nets, and we'll go to the six connected net. And there's one regular six connected net, and that is the primitive cubic structure of polonium. And there's one regular body center cubic net, and that would be the body center cubic structure. Okay, so we could continue going on to larger nets, but really by stopping here, we've covered a lot of the important nets for many common crystal structures. Uh, of course, here we're just talking about uninodal nets. So in some ways, these networks are, strictly speaking, only valid for elements. What if we want to talk about compounds? Starting from these important uninodal nets, we can develop compounds in a couple of different ways. One would be by a site ordering of the vertices. And what I mean by that, let me illustrate. So if we were to take the structure of Lonsdalite and we were to replace all of the silicon atoms with alternating zinc and sulfur, so we would get this site-ordered homeotype, that is the structure of vertsite, right? And so we could call this a 4-4 net because the two vertices now are different atoms, but they're both still tetrahedra at each vertex. If we were to do this same kind of site ordering to the diamond structure, we would get the structure of zinc blend or sphalerite. That's another 4-4 net. If we were to take the primitive cubic net and do a site ordering, we could get the rock salt structure, the sodium chloride structure. That's a 6-6 net. And if we were to take the body center cubic structure and do a site ordering, we could get the cesium chloride structure. Interestingly, these structures we see at the bottom, vertsite, sphalerite, sodium chloride, cesium chloride, these are structures we talked about when we talked about eutactic structures. We talked about the sphalerite structure being cubic close-packed anions with half of the tetrahedra holes filled. We talked about the sodium chloride structure being cubic close-packed array of anions with all of the octahedral holes filled. But in this lecture, we can see that we could have gotten to those same crystal structures by just thinking about ordering these highly symmetric uninodal nets. Another interesting thing we can get from looking at these is notice the reduction in symmetry we see in each case. So for Lon's Delight and Diamond, the size of the unit cell is the same before and after ordering. But notice that the point symmetry has changed. Lonsdalite is 6 over mmm, and vertsite is 6 mm. The diamond structure is m3 bar m, whereas the sphalerite structure is 4 bar 3 m. 
And the reason why this happens is because in the uninodal nets, there is a symmetry operation, which takes, for example, one carbon atom or one silicon atom, and it generates all the others from it. But in the vertside and sphaleride structures, not all of the sites are equivalent. So we have to lose some of those symmetry operations, and that leads to a reduction in point symmetry. If we look at these other examples, the primitive cubic to sodium chloride, or the body-centered cubic to cesium chloride, in these examples we see that the point symmetry actually doesn't change. It's M3 bar M in all cases. But what does change is actually the translational symmetry. In primitive cubic to sodium chloride structure, we actually double the length of the unit cell in all three directions. So we've lost translational symmetry because now we our brick that we're repeating is larger. We have to go farther before it starts repeating. But we do go from a smaller primitive cubic Brave lattice to a larger face-centered cubic Brave lattice. Body-centered cubic to cesium chloride transformation, uh, the unit cell doesn't get any bigger, but we do lose the body centering. So we go from a body-centered cubic lattice to a primitive cubic lattice. Another way we can go from an element in a uninodal net to a compound is that we could do something called network expansion. And by that, I mean we're going to keep the same vertices, but we're going to change the linker. So if we take the Lonsdalite structure and we were to put an oxygen atom as the linker between the two silicons, say, then we would get one of the polymorphs of SiO2. This is called the tritomite structure, and it's hexagonal. If we take the diamond structure and put an oxygen atom between each silicon, right at the midpoint of the bond, we would get what's called the idealized cristobalite structure. And that's another polymorph of SiO2. If we take the primitive cubic structure and we were going to put an oxygen in between each of the vertices, then we get the rhenium trioxide structure shown here. Uh, the rhenium trioxide structure, I might add, if we put a large cation right in the middle of the unit cell there, we would get the perovskite structure, which is a very important ternary structure type that we'll talk more about later. Also, remember last lecture we talked about the structure of sodium nitride, Na3N. And although it's not a very stable structure, when sodium nitride was finally made, it was found to have the REO3 type structure with nitrogen atoms on the corners of the cube surrounded by six sodium atoms. And here you can see the two-coordinate nature of the sodium. Another thing we can do to a network is we can do what's called decoration. And in decoration, we're going to replace some or all of the vertices with a more complicated group of atoms for the vertex. So one example would be the cesium chloride structure type here, which is also the structure of calcium telluride. If we were to replace the tellurium ion with a B6 ion, then we would have the calcium B6 structure. And this is an example of decoration of a network. Another thing we run into sometimes is something called interpenetration. Let's think about the structure of copper one oxide, Cu2O. So in the Cu2O structure, the oxygen is coordinated by four coppers. So the oxygen has a tetrahedral environment. And because there's twice as many coppers, it means its coordination number must be only half as large. And the copper one is actually two coordinate and its coordination is linear. So if you were to look at this image of a tetrahedral oxygen and linear copper, this is very much like the structure we were just talking about of cristobalite, SiO2. We've switched the anions and the cations. But the structure of Cu2O is not identical to that of beta cristobalite. And the reason why is because copper one oxide has cristobalite networks that interpenetrate each other. This uh, pink oxygen and this green copper, that network never connects to the network which is shown by the red oxygen and the coppery colored copper. 
And when you're trying to make frameworks that have quite large pore areas, the problem of interpenetration is something that comes up quite a bit. In this table, we see several important binodal networks. Earlier in the lecture, I talked about how we could go from elemental uninodal nets to compounds by site ordering or network expansion. But we could also take those examples and simply describe them as binodal nets. Right? For example, the structures of sphalerite and birdsite. Right? We started from the diamond or the lonsdalite networks, and then we ordered those networks into being binary compounds. But we could also talk about as being a binodal 4-4 network. The table we have here is actually very useful to think about in terms of our previous lecture, where, for example, I said, okay, I'm going to give you a cation coordination number. I'm going to give you an empirical formula. Now you tell me what must be the anion coordination number. Right? We talked about SiO2. I said, okay, silicon is going to be tetrahedral. So what can you tell me from there? Well, the connectivity balance told us that the oxygen must be two-coordinate. Now we come to this table and we say, okay, if, if I've got four-coordinate vertices and two-coordinate vertices, and there happen to be a tetrahedron and linear, then I'm going to get one of the SiO2 polymorphs. I could get the Cristobalite structure or the tritomite structure. There are some others that we haven't talked about. If I were to give you silicon nitrite and tell you, okay, silicon once again is going to be tetrahedral, you could do the connectivity balance and you would come back and realize that the nitrogen must be three-coordinate. And probably the most common three-coordinate structure we get would be a triangle. So what structure do we get when we have tetrahedral vertices and triangular vertices? And that would be the silicon nitride structure. Of course, the coordination number alone doesn't always specify the coordination geometry. For example, we know that in chemistry, when we have four coordination number, we normally get a tetrahedron, but sometimes we get a square. And if we get a square, then that leads us to different kinds of networks. If you have squares and triangles, you get this platinum 304 structure. If you get squares and squares, you get the niobium 2 oxide structure. If you get squares and tetrahedra, you're going to get the cooperite or platinum 2 sulfide structure. Then we see a bunch of networks and structures that go with them that result from octahedra. It's a very common in inorganic chemistry that the cation might be octahedrally coordinated and therefore an octahedral vertex. So if we make the other vertex linear, we get the REO3 structure. If we make it a triangle, we can get the structures of titanium dioxide, rutile and anatase. If we make it a tetrahedron, we could get the corundum structure. If the other vertex is also an octahedron, we get the rock salt structure. And then if we were to make it into a trigonal prism, we would get the nickel arsenide structure. And then we finish with uh, a couple of structures where the cation is actually a cubic vertex. And one of the things that we see is as the values of n and m go up, as the order of the vertices increases, there, there actually turns out to be fewer and fewer ways that they can be connected. Now, we've seen several of these structures already in our discussions, but there's a couple that we haven't talked about yet, and it would be interesting to finish by looking at those. So if we look at a couple of these 4-4 four, four nets that we get when we have a square coordination at the cation, we see the cooperite structure on the left, and there we have a square planar platinum-2 and tetrahedral sulfur. We see the niobium-2 oxide structure on the right, and in this unusual structure, we have square planar niobium and square planar oxygen. If we ignore the fact that some of the vertices are niobium and some are oxygen and just treat them all the same, this would be a regular network whereby all of the vertices are the same, all of the edges are the same, and all of the angles are the same. And this is actually the fifth and final example of a regular three-dimensional network. If we were to look at these 
six three nets that characterize the structures of TiO2. Here are the two most common, rutile on the left and anatase on the right. And notice in both of these, we have octahedral titanium. In the rutile structure, the coordination at oxygen comes pretty close to being trigonal planar, but it's not quite trigonal. Uh, you notice that the site symmetry here is uh, 2mm or C2V in the Schoenflies notation. In the anatase structure, we can clearly see the three coordinate oxygen here, but this is actually probably closer to T-shaped than it is to trigonal planar. Um, there's another high-pressure polymorph of TiO2 called brickite that also has this 6-3 net. And finally, let's just take a closer look at corundum. We talked about corundum when we were talking about ionic compounds and eutactic structures. And we said, okay, corundum is a hexagonal close packing of oxygens with aluminums filling two-thirds of the octahedral holes. And there's a ordering of the vacant octahedral sites uh, that allows the aluminums to shift away from each other. Here we see that, interestingly, corundum is the structure that results from probably the two most common coordination environments we find in inorganic chemistry, the octahedron for the aluminum and the tetrahedron for the oxygen. But interestingly, this network is not symmetric enough that we have either an ideal octahedron or an ideal tetrahedron. A pretty good clue to this is the fact that corundum has a rhombohedral structure. It's not cubic. And of course, you can't have perfect octahedral or perfect tetrahedral coordination unless the space group is cubic. Uh, not only is it not perfect, but in fact, the octahedral coordination is rather distorted, as we've already discussed. And maybe from this drawing on the right, you can see that the, the tetrahedron at oxygen is highly distorted. 